I'm in Parliament Square in Edinburgh. When that old parliament was closed down in 1707, there was a man who offered an alternative. The same man's credited with inventing money and bankrupt in France. Ah, and maybe a murder along the way. It's quite a tale. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right. In the meantime, let me sell you a story. Today's story is going to involve royalty, political intrigue, high finance, pan-European conflict and at least two duels. We'll traverse European borders, the Atlantic Ocean and I'll point to lessons for us today and it all starts here. You see, back in 1761, there would have been little shops and booths, trading stalls, leaning against the side of St Giles Cathedral here. At least one of them was a goldsmith belonging to William Law. Now, goldsmiths like William often branched out into banking. People would come to you with gold. You would hold it securely for them and give them a bill to confirm their ownership. Now, they might use that bill as a means of exchange or security in some other transaction, knowing that the real gold was secure with you. Well, there's no point in just sitting in that gold, is there? You lend it out to somebody who needs it. And of course, charge interest. I mean, you wouldn't lend all of it out. That would be mental. What if your depositors wanted some of it back? But they're not all going to want it back at the same time. So you keep, say, 20% of the gold in the back shop, so the rest could be working for you, the depositor, and the person who wants to borrow it. Perfect. It's only a problem if some drama meant that everyone needed their money back at the same time. Then you'd end up throwing yourself off a bridge and being rescued by an angel called Clarence who's trying to earn his wings only to discover that the town just wouldn't be the same without you. But that's not how this story ends. William Law has 12 children, but only four of them survive to maturity. The eldest son, John, will go on to take the concept of paper money way further than Daddy could have ever imagined. John's smart, he's great with figures, but he's a bit of a wild one. And they send him off to rural Eaglesham for an education under the watchful eye of a covenanting Presbyterian uncle. Dad William bought Lorison Castle, an estate here on the outskirts of Edinburgh. Now, these days you can still come and visit, but he died before he really got the chance to enjoy it. Young John was 12. His mum Jean was a strong, resourceful Scotswoman who continued the money lending business, quite successfully, as it turns out. John went from school to university, but he didn't finish. He started to become difficult refusing to sign documents as heir to his dad and suing his mum to get his inheritance now. When that case was eventually settled, John swanned off to foreign parts in the bright lights of London. Whilst he hadn't finished his education, as a Scotch gentleman in London, he used his proficiency with numbers at the gambling tables. So successful was he that he ran out of money. And in order to avoid debtor's prison, he wrote back to Mummy asking her to sell the estate here to pay off his debts. Fortunately, his mum must have had a more practical head for figures than he did because she had enough money to buy out his creditors and avoid being put out of her own home. So that was John's difficulties over then. Everyone knows that when your mum gets you out of debtors' prisons by the skin of your teeth, the next thing you want to do is get yourself into a duel to the death. Fortunately, he got out of that alive, which put him in the dock for murder and the death penalty. Frying pan, fire. He was found guilty. Now, the good news was that few people had actually been executed for killing somebody in a duel, and he was reprieved by the King William the Orange One, who promptly went off to Europe where England was in a constant state of war with France. The bad news is that the dead man's family then took the matter to the civil court, where the penalty was still death. So, still in that fire. 
bad news that things weren't really going that well in the court proceedings. Good news, the King's Bench Jail was notorious for people escaping thanks to bribery. Money talked, and it said, we are gold and silver coins. We are durable, transportable, measurable, exchangeable, and a good store of value. That's why they use us as money. But keeping gold and silver secure presented problems. And limited supply of these precious metals meant that the total potential for trade was limited. Billy the Orange King had his own money worries. Borrowing enough of it to fund his armies in the continent was a constant problem. Partly because people weren't entirely sure that they'd get their money back. We need a new invention. Better call a Scotsman. William Patterson was from farming stock in Dumfries. Now, I say he invented, Patterson's scheme was built on previous ideas. A group of private investors would come together to form a bank. The bank lent money to the king and the government guaranteed to pay it back some years later. It's a wee bit like gilt-edged securities these days. When you deposited funds, you got banknotes saying that the government would guarantee to pay the bearer on demand on production of this note. William got his money for the war effort and confidence in the banknotes meant that they circulated around the economy. Well, to a certain extent. I mean, obviously, you wouldn't use them for simple purchases like a cup of coffee. You'd use contactless for that. But it was an innovation. And that private bank set up by William Patterson is now called the Bank of England. Anyway, our hero John Law is now free. He's escaped England and he's travelling on the continent. He refines his studies in mathematics, probability and finance, and his more scientific gambling starts to make him a small fortune. Now, I say he's travelling Europe, but he does have limitations. He desperately wants to obtain a pardon for the whole killing and escaping thing, so he can't afford to upset the English crown. As he travels Europe, he has to avoid places with whom England's at war. Now, he's not the only Scotsman in the era with this problem. Since James VI, the King of England also happens to be the Scottish King. So there are a number of laws put in place to say that Scots can't trade with England's enemies, some of whom are Scotland's historical trading partners. At the same time, you're not allowed to trade with our colonies either. In an attempt to find a trading solution, the Scots are seduced by another scheme set up by William Patterson. Remember the Bank of England guy? Well, he came back up to Scotland to suggest setting up a colony in Central America to monopolise trade across the Isthmus of Panama, joining the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. Now, John Law's brother signed up for this scheme. Now, the whole escapade needs more than one episode in itself, so let me know in the comment section if that's of interest to you. The bottom line is that this adventure to a place called Darien is a disaster. And nobody in the British Isles comes out of it looking very good. Actually, the Irish are probably off the hook. But Scots have lost half their capital. You know, that limited supply of gold and silver coin stuff. Anyway, England is now involved in the War of the Spanish Succession and the Queen of England, also Scotland, is Anne. In fact, our transatlantic cousins will call this Queen Anne's War. Anne's approaching death, having lost all of her children before her. And the movers and shakers in England want to make sure that when that happens, Scotland can't choose its own monarch. So they use this post darian capital crisis to impose an incorporating union where Scotland loses its sovereignty, but gets access to the trade whose embargo had caused the problem in the first place. Enter John Law the guy that this video is about. Well, he isn't charged of any crime in Scotland. It's a different country to England, remember. So he comes back to Scotland with a solution. His proposal points out that money is not wealth. 
It's merely a token that we use to exchange wealth. The wealth of a nation didn't consist of holdings of rare and beautiful metals, but the labour of its people and the fruits of the earth. Scotland was a nation of literate and genius people with skills, knowledge and productivity to offer the world, which was wealth in itself, as the ensuing Scottish Enlightenment would show. He proposed a system of paper money, with the paper being backed by land. Now, land wasn't movable like silver and gold, but it didn't need to be. Paper was. Goods and services could be traded and exchanged with the paper money, and the economy could grow to its full potential. John Law's proposals were debated here in the Scottish Parliament. Some were for it. Others insisted that being subsumed in an incorporating union with England was the only solution. Now, if you think that the whole debate gets heated these days, then back then it led to two parliamentarians taking it outside and having a duel on Leith Sands. As it was, neither of the parliamentarians were killed, so we ended up with two more politicians than we actually needed and no solution. Plus ça change. Ultimately, Parliament rejected Law's system of money that's not a million miles away from the one that we use now as impractical. And the parcel of rogues in this building took us into that incorporating union and John Law went back to the continent. His base had been the Netherlands and he'd made himself a wealthy man by judicious gambling, trading and financial schemes, including underwriting and effectively saving the state lottery which the Dutch government had launched to fund its continuing involvement with the Spanish succession slash Anne's war as England was backing out. Oh, England had now become Great Britain. So, when he stopped off in Paris on the way across Europe, he might have been a British citizen committing treason by this very act. He'd suggested a solution for Scotland's financial troubles, he'd got the Dutch out of a financial fix, and now he had proposals for France, who were pretty near bankrupted by their involvement in these ongoing European wars. Ah, the French consulate. The advantage of dealing with France was that it was an absolute monarchy. All that parliamentarians dueling and stuff didn't really matter so long as you could get access to the king. The problem was that he couldn't get access to the king. Now, he did have access to the Duc d'Orléans, the king's nephew, but he didn't have the influence needed to get past the king's inner circle, who, needless to say, had carved up the turkey for... Actually, I'm not sure we had turkeys at the side of the Atlantic at that stage. Doesn't matter, the point is that the Duc d'Orléans may have liked his ideas, but that didn't get him far. Until the king died just after the next three heirs to the throne predeceased him. This left his five-year-old great-grandson Louis XV as the new king and the regent running things, his uncle, the Duc d'Orléans. Now, we're already running over, so I'm going to have to try and concertina five years of an experiment with paper money in a couple of minutes. Please bear in mind all this time that there's bagpipes going on and, one, there's vested interests in France that don't want to change. And they certainly don't want change introduced by some foreigner who's going to become rich along the way. Two, war in Europe and the colonies seems continual. The only thing that changes is who's aligned with whom. And French internal politics and economics is often determined by these military actions, which largely created the financial problems in the first place. And three, John Law clearly has the ear and increasing influence in the region, the Duc d'Orléans, but he's not in charge. He's an advisor, but he doesn't have ultimate power. So, in 1715, the French king is in debt, in no small part due to wars against England, now Britain, along with her various allies. The crown will never have enough money to repay the debt, so they devalue the loans and IOUs outstanding. John Law's suggestion is a national bank based on paper money, 
But vested interest means that he has to settle for his bank general, a private bank. He takes in coin and issues banknotes, guaranteed at the value of coin at the time that they were exchanged. Gradually, belief increases in a bank that the establishment had been determined to denigrate. People started to have confidence in paper money, which became the main means of exchange for pretty much any sizable transaction. Oh, and by the way, the French had declared ownership in Mississippi. Now, I'm not talking about the Mississippi that you recognise today. Broadly, on the map, the blue bit was French. John Law got himself a monopoly to deal with almost everything that came out of the blue bit for 25 years. And he launched a company that called the Company of the West. Let's call it the Mississippi Company, because that's what lots of people called it at the time. He issued shares in the company. Now, given that this colony had produced close to nothing up until now, folks weren't that enthused. But when he said that folk could buy shares with a crappy, devalued French government debt, they got a wee bit more enthusiastic. Still, not enough to sell all the shares, so the Duc d'Orléans bought a huge bunch of them and even more on behalf of the king. The Mississippi Company was up and running. Just as Scots had gone off to their proposed colony in Darien, French were sent off to Louisiana, named after the French king Louis. A capital was built and named New Orleans, after the Duc d'Orléans. Now, through a series of events, including John Law inventing new financial instruments, shares in the Mississippi Company soared way above the actual value of trade. In the street where shares were sold, you could make or lose a fortune in the time that you walk from the road end to the exchange booth. Apparently, one hunchback made a fortune by renting out his back to be used as a table for folks signing documents. Servants who were sent to sell shares for their masters at a certain price made fortunes because they got there to find that the price had gone up and they pocketed the difference. There was a buying frenzy unheard of again until they reissued that original flavoured iron brew back in 2019, remember? That's how mental things were. London was panicking because their people were rushing to France to buy shares in the Mississippi Company. The East India Company was also panicking. You see, the major shareholders in the Mississippi Company were John Law, the Regent Duc d'Orléans and the young French King. Law used the inflated value of his shares to buy the French companies trading to the Indies and to the South Americas, competitors of the British East India Company. He now controlled pretty much all of France's international trade and the tax regime, which he'd simplified, and he was the wealthiest man in Europe. Now, along the way, wars continued, and Law's Bank General had been so successful that the Duc d'Orléans decided to solve his money worries by nationalising the bank. It was now the State Bank. The problem was that he set aside some of the checks and balances that Law had put in place. If money was paper, you could just print more of it. Now, you and I know that that just devalues the money. As soon as somebody lost confidence, took a huge chunk of their deposit out of the bank, there was a run on the bank. How did we stop the collapse? A number of edicts were issued. You were only allowed to use the paper money. No? Okay, buying and selling or taking coin out of the country, that's banned. Oh, and that currency matching the value of coin at the time is issued thing, yeah, that's going to have to go too. In an attempt to rein in money supply, John Law refused some loans. That caused the Mississippi share price to plummet. Okay, I'll issue the loans. That caused the value of the currency to plummet. Now, any economist knows that if you want to increase the value of something, you reduce the supply. So John Law took back loads of the devalued money and publicly burned it in an attempt to increase confidence in the value of the money. But the public weren't economists. They just looked and thought, shit, is that all our money's worth? Traders demanded coin instead of paper. 
nobody knew the value of anything, crime stalked the streets, and there was an outbreak of bubonic plague. It was like Kirkcaldy on a wet Wednesday in October. Another devaluation meant that the Mississippi Company and this new French National Bank were essentially bankrupt, and John Law had to flee another country undercover, suffering the final indignity that as he left, customs officers took the few coins left him under the law that he himself had implemented to stop coin leaving the country. To make ends meet, John Law returned to professional gambling and a bit of art dealing. Oh, and a bit of spying for Great Britain, the country against whom he may have committed treason by going to France in the first place. The country that may never have existed if his financial solution had been adopted in Scotland. So what lesson did we learn from this? The system that John Law proposed isn't that different from what we have today. The main difference is that for us, money's no longer even paper. It's ones and zeros in an IT server somewhere God knows where. And a small group have way more zeros after the one than the rest of us. Is it that this house of cards based on no more than confidence was doomed to failure and always is? Or is it? that it works so long as politicians and bankers don't create unintended consequences for short-term expedience. France, in as bad and probably a worse state than Scotland had been, didn't have to be subsumed into an incorporating union with England to survive. It still exists as a proud country, using paper money. So now you know, when you read some article saying that Scotland had to become part of the UK as the only solution to its problems in the early 18th century, it's not worth the paper it's printed on. I'll get my hat, my tin hat. If you'd like a video about another incredible Scotsman, then there's one coming up on screen now. In the meantime, I mean, dog is going to be a lamb at life. Sherry and Drastic.